good afternoon, everyone. I think we have a couple time zones here. So somebody might be in the uh, morning, early morning, and somebody is in the afternoon now. So uh, first, uh, please let me brief introduction. I'm Xian Mingden from Xiamen University. I'm glad to be the moderator of this section today. So uh, first, please let me to introduce the about this section a little bit. And we know this is this forum is the World Laureate Association Young Scientist Forum, specifically focused on life science. So this for, forum brings together today's uh, most outstanding young scientists while focusing on displaying the most cutting edge scientific achievements and the progress trends. It also promotes exchange and understanding between scientists of different generations, inspiring new academic ideas and jointly promoting scientific progress. So today, this section will focus on the latest research in immunology, drug science, and new drug research and development. And then let me uh, introduce our honorable guest today. There are four Nobel laureates. I will introduce them in alphabet order of family name. So the first is the Jules Hoffman. Professor Hoffman won the Nobel Prize in 2011 in Physiology of Medicine for their discovery concerning the activation of innate immunity. We also well know the Tor gene. And our second honorable guest is the Professor Irvin Naha. He's the Nobel Prize winner in 1991 in physiology and medicine for their discovery concerning the function of single ion channel in cells. And our third guest is Professor Kurt Woodrich. He won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 22, 2002 for his development of nuclear magnet resonance spectral for determining the three-dimensional structure of biological macromolecules in solution. And our first uh, guest is the Nobel laureate Ada Yunesh. She won the 2009 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for studies of the structure and function of the ribosome. So let's get a warm welcome for all four of the honorable guests. And so after that, uh, according to our schedule, we will go further to uh, give a few uh, introduction for each of our young scientists. These were also according to the alphabet order of the family name for our young scientists in this section. We have six young scientists join this discussion today. So I will introduce to one by one later. And the first uh, scientist is the Professor Jian Jingchen. He is principal investigator in iHuman Institute, Shanghai Tech University, China. So first, let's uh, get uh, started from the Professor Chen. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. So Professor Teng, I'm going to present my slides now. OK. Yes, please. Can you see my slides? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Professor Deng, for the very kind introduction. And thanks for the organizers for inviting me. It's my great pleasure to join this forum today. 
So dear Lawrence, uh, dear colleagues, uh, my uh, the title of my uh, talk is CPCR targeted my system chemistry. As you may know, mental disorders such as schizophrenia and depression are mostly associated with the dysfunctions of aminergic GPCRs, such as the dopamine receptors and the serotonin receptors. In the last two decades, breakthroughs have been made in GPCR structural biology and GPCR biased signaling. These have laid a foundation for the next generation GPCR drug discovery. However, how to achieve a GPCR subtype selectivity and how to rationally design uh, bars the GPCR ligands have been extremely, extremely challenging. So my job as a medicinal chemist is to work very closely with GPCR biologists to address such challenges. And my goal is to discover drug candidates with better therapeutic efficacy and fewer side effects. I'm very glad to share with you three stories in the next few slides. So in the first story, we focused on a chemical scaffold known as PCPMA for the design of novel aminergic GPCR ligands. So we successfully designed highly selective serotonin 2C agonist as shown with this general structure. And these compounds have very good brain penetration properties. One such compound has been licensed to a biotech company and now is in phase one clinical trials for the potential treatment of epilepsy. Also focusing on PCPMA, we also further modified this scaffold to get dopamine D3 and the dopamine D3, uh, D2 ligands respectively. Some compounds showed very promising antipsychotic effects in mice. In the second case, our medicinal chemistry efforts have been greatly helped by the GPCR structure biology. Uh, the discoveries made by cl my collaborator, Sheng Wang, who we'll present uh, later. His team solved the crystal structures of the third generation, antipsychotics, eriprozole, and curprozine, bond structures of the serotonin 2A receptors. They observed the binding pose However, showed us that the pharmacophore, uh, secondary pharmacophore SP inserts very deeply into the helix bundle rather than floating up very shallowly, which was believed by medicinal chemists in the past. But this one was incorrect and uh, the right one is as shown here. So with this correct model to gain uh, selectivity for dopamine D2 and against the serotonin 2A, we should aim at this uh, substructure circled in red here. So we designed a series of uh, compounds with uh, uh, a new moiety uh, shown here in blue. And uh, such compounds showed excellent selectivity for the dopamine D2 receptors. And uh, one selected compound, 7041, exhibits excellent antipsychotic, antidepressive, and also prove cognitive effects. And this compound has been licensed to a pharmaceutical company for further development. As you may know, the rapid acting antidepressant effects of psychedelics has drawn worldwide attention. So in my third story, again, my, collabor my collaborator Wang Sheng solved the crystal structure of psychedelic compounds, for example, here, uh, salosin uh, from the magic mushroom with the serotonin 2A receptor. A lot of information can be obtained from analyzing the structures, but uh, one most important uh, feature is that we were able to generate this very simple model. Here shows that the blue circle, uh, the blue EBP is associated with beta resting signaling. The red OBP is associated with G protein signaling, and the gray DBP is believed uh, to be responsible for antagonist activity. So with this very simple model, with, as a guide, we, we started from the 2E antagonist, the cut off this tail 
to get an unbiased serotonin 2E agonist 7113. Then we appended a, a new TIL group to get this compound 7084, which is a beta resting biased partial agonist of the serotonin 2A receptor. And in animal models, this compound 7084 is non-hallucinogenic, non but should very promising antidepressant effects in these animals. So this work provide a novel direction for the discovery of a non-hallucinogenic 2A agonist as rapid acting antidepressants. And my collaborator Wang Sheng will uh, give you more details later. So to uh, very quickly summarize, I believe that the advances in GTCR biology structure-guided medicinal chemistry can be very helpful in the discovery of both subtype selective and functionally selective GPCR drug candidates. But our further question is, the etiology and the treatment of mental disorders is usually involved uh, with multiple receptors and also sometimes ion channels. So to target one receptor, it seems easier, but rational polypharmacology is even more challenging, which will need the collaborations among neuroscientists, structural biologists, computational chemists and biologists, also medicinal chemists. So here I look forward to more collaborations in this field. Uh, that's uh, my presentation. Thank you for your time and I um, will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank Professor Chen for sharing. So we might can take a few questions. Okay, please, uh, Professor Woodridge. It was a nice presentation. I enjoyed uh, your summary. Your Thank work you. depends very much and very intimately on results from structural biology. To what extent have you experience with structures that have not been experimentally determined, but rather come out of artificial intelligent approaches, I mean, predictions of structures such as AlphaFold? Thank you for your question, uh, Professor Withrich. So uh, in, in my experience and uh, my collaborations with uh, Wang Sheng, the structural biologist who will present later, uh, we think uh, experimental structures are much more helpful for the drug discovery efforts. So GBCR, as you're uh, quite familiar with, uh, are highly dynamic and the structures are, you know, uh, even very little difference can make a big difference for drug discovery efforts. So now we take uh, experimental structures more seriously uh, when designing new compounds. Okay, I have a question, Erwin, here. Uh, I wonder how did you find your in initial lead structures? Did you uh, screen libraries? Did you involve uh, traditional Chinese medicine? Uh, or how did you proceed in the beginning? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nier, uh, for your question. So uh, I shared the three stories. Uh, in the first one, this PCPMA scaffold as actually a derivative from a, a high throughput screening hit uh, from, uh, with only one carbon difference. So we add this carbon to get this PCPMA scaffold. It's a, a small chemical. So, uh, and the second and the third uh, stories, we started from actually marketed drugs. Aripoprazole uh, was approved in uh, 2005 and Lumetron, uh, was a, a, it was another uh, antipsychotic drug approved in 2019. So okay. we started this uh, uh, marketed <clears throat> drug, but we modified their uh, structures as well as pharmacological uh, profiles to get, you know, get compounds with new functions and new biological mm -hmm. outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, may I? 
Hello. Yes. Hello, Professor Hoffman. Yes. <clears throat> so this is not typically my field, but I was very interest, interested in your very clear presentation. I have one question, which may be very naive. Uh, those molecules which you showed to us and you look at their properties, do they, uh, they must also have properties in other directions, no? I mean, off-target uh, uh, properties which you do not propose here or consider here, or how do you get rid of those? Oh, yes, that, that's very challenging for uh, drug discovery efforts. So usually uh, uh, structure-guided uh, uh, approaches will be very helpful, but screening is also very important. So usually we will have to make a series of different compounds and then screening will tell us uh, which one is uh, more selective with less off-target uh, interactions and we will choose that one for further development. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, due to the time limit, we just uh, give a question and comments stop here. We might have more time later in the discussion. So let's uh, invite the second speaker, Professor Sun Wang. He is a collaborator with Jian Jingchen. So he, he will share some uh, story more in de detail as the Professor Chen mentioned earlier a little bit. So let's welcome uh, Professor Sun Wang. All right. Uh, good, af good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May maybe a good morning. I don't know which to say. Uh, morning. We know that uh, most of the drug can bind its target and then to have some therapeutic effect. And uh, we all also know that drug can bind its off target to induce some side effect. So there's no such thing as a total safe medicine. So what we are doing is that with that structure uh, based to uh, discovery more safe or more effective drug or medicine. Uh, from uh, with the development of that structure biology, now we can easily to solve that most of the protein with this drug and as to see how this drug binds its receptor. Uh, from here, you can see that is very important drug target, a dopamine receptor, and that's three members. With this uh, structure solved, we know that there is a specific pocket for dopamine D4 receptor. With this structure information, we can run that uh, virtual screening to target that this specific uh, pocket. After running several uh, optimization, you can easily get some very selective ligand, for example, for this D4 receptor. When we select this ligand, it can only activate D4 receptor in all of our human GBCR. With this method we developed, Right now, we can explain it to other targets. Uh, right uh, next, I will share two samples and the previous Jian uh, Jun already mentioned. I will give you different angles. Uh, first story is we want to clean antistatotic uh, drugs or design. Yeah. Right now, if there are three generation uh, antistatotics, the most popular one is amplified, also called aripropozole. It combines into D2 receptor to control our psychosis. And with structure, we know how it binds into our receptor. And as just the previous mentioned, all of this drug can bind in ton of the off targets. For example, for Abilify, they can bind in ton of off targets to induce a weight gain or sedation, such as a side effect. But with this structure in our hand, we can see that for D2, a receptor, the pocket is larger than that primary farm call to bind. So uh, with collaboration, our collaborator, that Jen Dream, we enlarge that primary farm call to uh, touch this D2 receptor pocket. Then easily you will get off most of off target receptor. Finally, get rid of this compound. Uh, after screening, you can see it only binding dopamine D2, D3 and uh, 5G1A receptor. In the following that mice behavior screening, we found that this compound can throw D2 receptor to control psychosis. And also it can uh, throw that 5G1A receptor to have some relief depression-like symptoms. Right now, the compound is in clinical de development. We hope that with clinical trial, 
may be that compound target B, uh, D2, D3 receptor and 5HD1 receptor, it will be next uh, generation antisatotic. For this sample, I show you how to get rid of that another receptor. For next uh, section, uh, I will show you that how we can design that one uh, compound in one receptor to get rid of its of, uh, side effect. Just the previous change you mentioned, that psychedelic. Uh, as you may know that right now, traditional antidepressant, it will lead three to four weeks to take some effect. But clinical trial shows that psychedelic can have some antidepressant effect in 24 hours. So it's amazing, but it also can induce that hallucination. So right now, with the structure, we know that uh, uh, such as LSD or magical mushroom salicin, it combining its target receptor, serotonin 2A receptor, in two pocket, pocket one and pocket two at the same time. If the compound binding these two pocket at the same time, it will induce very, very strong activation of both pathway, G protein pathway and beta resting pathway. And then it will induce hallucination effect. And also it can still show that antidepressive effect. But what we found that if that compound, if bind one of the pocket, pocket two, it will only can activate beta resting. Then collaborate with Jenjun's group, we designed one of the compound just to target this pocket two. As you may see that this compound only activated beta resting signaling. And in the mice, this compound didn't show any hallucination effect, but it still keeps its antidepressive effect. Right now, Jenjun and I is to optimize this compound. We want to put this compound to clinical trial to see whether this uh, strategy is work for that patient. And uh, last, I want to say that structure-based drug design definitely works, at least in GPCR field. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for Professor Wang for give a nice uh, talk. So we have a couple minutes to comments and any questions. Yeah, please, Professor. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah, please. Can I ask? Yeah, sure, please. Uh, Professor, you're next. Uh, I understand that the two, the two lectures talked about finding compounds that can, uh, that can uh, penetrate unwanted material like other proteins. How much do you, do you worry about not binding to some other places in the body or some other proteins, especially when you talk about a medication? Uh, mostly you mean that how we can get rid of that uh, other pocket, that, that's right? I don't know get rid of, I, I would like not to have other pockets. Or at least how, how much you, how, how much you, your mind is working on specific pockets that do not exist anywhere else in the uh body. Yeah, first, uh, we, uh, all of the, we show that finally we will use a structure biology to show which compound, uh, for, for example, for this compound, the this is the structure that shows it's only binding this pocket. And uh, for other receptor, usually we just screening ton of the receptor to see whether this compound can bind in that, uh, uh, that receptor. For this specific, that uh, this compound, we screening that, that uh, all of the dopamine receptor, serotonin receptor, adrenergic receptor, it only binding that uh, uh, 5-HT2 family receptor. Yeah. In mice? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, for behavior assay, we screening in the mice. And uh, for all of this function assay, it's used human, uh, uh, human line, uh, it's a human vector to screening. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Okay, any more questions? 
as a word. Okay. Uh, I, have, I have two connected questions. Uh, the first is, to what extent do structures determined by modeling with alpha fold and similar, actually, I know that GPCRs are not mostly uh, treated by alpha fold. How do they facilitate your work in experimental structure determination? And then the follow-up question is, do you now use X-ray crystallography or cryo-EM or both for obtaining the work that you described? All right. Thank you, uh, Professor Urish. Uh, for first question, that alpha fold, it definitely can predict most of our GPCR that scan fold. But for a uh, specific detail, how that compound can bind in that uh, receptor for, for detail that pocket information, it still needs to uh, optimization. So right now, what we are doing that all of our uh, start is start from that crystal uh, structure, because this is two to three years ago structure, uh, we developed this. And also, we are, right now, we are trying to solve some crowd EM uh, structure, because that, that is easier for all of our structure biology. Yeah. Do, uh, can predicted structures be directly used for molecular replacement in your structure determination methods? After all, all GPCRs uh, have seven transmembrane helices, yeah. and it's actually very difficult to make a mistake in the prediction of the global fold, that's a global fold. For global prediction, it's very, very easy. And for specific compound binding to which pocket, it will be very difficult. For example, for this, uh, this part, we found that LSD, it can bind in pocket one, pocket two uh, at the same time because it's larger uh, molecular. But for silicin, uh, we found that in our structure, if this receptor without lipid, it can bind into pocket one, what we call it austeric binding pocket. But with that lipid insert into this receptor, this silicin will bind into pocket two. But yes, yeah. uh, we understand uh, that uh, details needed for, uh, as a basis for drug development are best obtained by experiments. But can we now say that your experimental work is limited to refining those areas of the structure that are potential ligand binding sites for the drugs. That for would greatly reduce the amount of work to be done. Yeah, for automated that uh, we believe that AI will definitely can solve what we are doing. But right now, uh, we always trust our experimental data. That, that is only what I can say. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Udrich, and thank you, Professor Wang. Due to the time limit, let's move to the next uh, speaker. So next one will be myself. So let me share my slides first. So uh, yeah, I'm glad to be have this chance to share some uh, our uh, results regarding the for untargeted kinase drug discovery. Actually, I, I'm training as a chemist and then starting from as a postdoc research. And then I uh, move, switch a little bit from the pure uh, organic synthetic chemistry to the chemical biologist. So currently in my lab, we are working on the interface of chemistry and biology. So first, let me think why we choose the untouched kinase as our uh, target for drug discovery. As we all know, since the 2001, the first uh, kinase inhibitor called the Gleevec was launched in clinical. I think they were uh, heralded the, called the targeted cancer therapy. So currently have more than 70 small molecule kinase inhibitor in market. But 
comparing with we have more than 500 kinase in the human kinome, actually, when we do a detailed analysis, we will find that actually only very small population of the kinase have been targeted. But we, we all know that kinase to play a pivotal role in signal transduction and cell proliferation and all kinds of biological process. So there is a big gap regarding the, the human kinome. So some of the kinase, they don't have any tool compounds. So there were hurdle the further biological validation for their functions. So in our lab, we have two, we're asking two key questions. First, how to uh, efficiently develop new chemical tool for these we call the untargeted kinase. And another, how can we use the tool compound we have the, once we have developed to further pharmacologically validate those untargeted kinase to developing new uh, therapeutics. So first starting to build our actually called the new chemical space or more in detail is how to get started to build a compound design and build compound library. Looking for, uh, we all know in the medicinal chemistry, we call those the scaffolds with the biological function, we call the privileged scaffold. So here is an example. We're looking for privileged scaffold from marine nature products. And here, these compounds were all from the marine microorganism. They have a common structure called the quinazoline. And it's brand new here. They fuse with a seven member ring. So this is is new to, to further develop. So we choose this as an example. And with this strategy, in the past uh, few years, we have built up our own in-house focused library. And then to do the further screening and later example from this in-house library, we have discovered a couple uh, untagged kinase inhibitor. So from there, we think this strategy is effective and useful. So as I mentioned before, most of the kinase inhibitor now in clinical is used for cancer treatment. But as I also mentioned, there are more biological function need to be explored. So first, one of the target we were explore called the kinase MST1 and 2 it's on the upstream of hypocinerine pathway. So he has been reported to relate to the tissue repair and regeneration. So from our in-house library, we were successfully to identify a small molecule we name as XMU-MP-1. With this compound, we do the further pharmacological validation to validate that this compound can promote liver regeneration in certain animal models. Uh, thanks for uh, introducing me uh, and thanks for your invitation. It's my great honor to be here to report some program on the viral structure-based vaccine design. I'm Xiang Xi uh, from Institute of Biophysics, Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, the key challenge in the development of inactivate vaccine is to uh, is how to maintain the immunogenicity of fragile viruses after several rounds of purification steps. SARS-CoV-2, uh, a coronavirus, has collapsed uh, collapsed spikes. Uh, they look like stellar coroner in the electron macros micrographs. Uh, we applied. Uh, electron imaging technology to uh, vaccine development to guide the purification. Uh, the left figure, uh, so most uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 surface specs fall off. Uh, this indicates purification procedures are not suitable, leading to the shedding of the specs. Uh, but the red 
figures. Uh, so uh, after optimizing purification, tens of specs are decorated on the particle surface in, in a perfusion conformation. Uh, in addition, uh, systematic analysis of the correlation between the uh, alteration of virus particle properties and uh, the protection efficacy in animal models can facilitate to estimate uh, reasonable quality control during vaccine production, ensuring the batch to patch uh, batch to patch consistency. Uh, up application of electron imaging and the high throughput sequencing techniques uh, largely speed up the development of inactivated vaccine. The ongoing evolution and the emergence, em, emergency of SARS-CoV-2 variants has raised uh, the concerns about uh, the effectiveness of vaccine. Furthermore, we know uh, the immune response elicited either by vaccination or the natural infection uh, will win over time. Is it necessary to receive a uh, booster uh, vaccination or, and when to receive it? Uh, the, the immune me mechanism of booster uh, immunization are poorly uh, understood. Uh, administration of a third dose uh, six months after the second can uh, significantly boost the immune response. Uh, here, we have dissected uh, the immunogenic uh, profiles of antibodies from three dose vaccines, two dose vaccines, uh, and uh, uh, convalescence. We can see the better neutralizing breath and uh, quick recall and the long lasting uh, uh, human response were observed. The ongoing antibody somatic uh, mutation, memory B, cell clonal turnover and uh, antibody uh, composition change in B cell repertoire, driven by prolonged and repeated antigen uh, stimulation can confer the development of uh, monoclonal antibodies with enhanced neutralizing potency and breath. Uh, our funding, uh, this funding uh, rationalizes uh, rationalize the use of three-dose uh, immunization uh, for the inactivated virus uh, vaccines. The above, the above slides reviewed the molecular mechanism of booster vaccination to induce to a, a broad spectrum and a protective immune response. And I found that uh, there are about 7% uh, of antibodies uh, with uh, broad neutralizing activity against uh, uh, many uh, viral variants, including the Omicron sub, sub lineage in the memory B derived, uh, derived antibody repertoire. This uh, memory B cells can be special, can specially activated and uh, uh, proliferate to produce a large, uh, a large number of plasma cells. Uh, uh, this, th this plasma cells can secrete uh, high efficiency uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, this was expected to achieve the protection against the severe clinical uh, syndrome uh, in, uh, infected by Omicron. Uh, these results have been verified in a real world study in Hong Kong five months, uh, five months after the basic research observations. In addition, uh, we forthwith analyzed the, the uh, spike structures of all circulating variants uh, and determined the uh, immune escape, uh, escape mutation profiles, aptitude distribution of over 1,000 
neutralizing antibodies. This reviewed uh, the viral infection characteristics of new variants, uh, such as uh, in vitro stability, uh, binding affinity with, uh, to the receptor, and fusion ability, and the risk, uh, risk to cross species transmission, as well potential impact uh, on the vaccine protective efficacy. These basic studies provide a scientific basis uh, for the formulation of COVID-19 prevention and control strategies. Last slides, uh, in, in the past 20 years, there are in total three uh, epidemics caused by human coronavirus, including SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, these three are presum uh, presumably uh, derived from the bats and ad adapted in human beings. However, the underlying uh, mechanism for cross body transformation uh, and uh, adaptive evolution uh, are largely unknown. Uh, we first demonstrated uh, two most like virus. Uh, they uh, uh, lack NEO, COVID, and the PDF. They use ACE2, uh, but not uh, rather than BPP4 as a receptor uh, to infect bats. Fortunately, uh, these two mers like viruses uh, do not recognize human ACE2, uh, do not infect uh, human cells. However, uh, only two mutation on the specs of the least two virus can lead to uh, successful uh, infections in human cells. This highlights a great significance and demand for broad spectrum vaccine uh, development for plant mm -hmm. subic virus. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, in the comments. thank you. I assume that I should still play uh, chair of this session. Thank yes. you. Uh, we have time for one question. And I would be very interested to hear from Jules Hoffman. Okay, this seems to be oh. very interesting. I'm, um, I'm impressed, but I would need to be able to discuss for longer with you. <laughs> Just one or two minutes doesn't help us. Okay. But congratulations for your work, anyway. Uh, th uh, thank you. Well, I want to thank both Dr. Wang and Dr. Hoffman. And I would like to ask the two next speakers to keep to their time so that we can keep in the program. The next speaker is Dr. Zhang Ye. And he'll speak from structural biology to biological structure. So, hello everyone. Can you hear me and uh, see my slides? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, I'll start. Uh, so first, I would like to thank the uh, organizers. The organizers. <laughs> <laughs> and today, I'm not going to talk uh, about this, some detail of my research, but uh, rather to raise a topic to discuss. So my title is from structural biology to biological structure. Uh, in uh, 1953, Olson and Craig uh, determined the structure of dubstrand uh, uh, Henix DNA. Uh, so in the New York Times, the comes that research uh, making a scientific revolution. After that, uh, actually so after that, so the central dogma was uh, uh, established and the, the generic genetic code uh, was revealed and all those uh, together uh, uh, needed the birth uh, of modern molecular biology. In the meantime, uh, the product of uh, a gene uh, protein, uh, the structure, uh, myoglobin and homoglobin structure was first determined by Max Prutz and uh, John Kenjo in 1958. 
So after their structure, basically we can uh, start to know what's a mechanism uh, for those complex machine, molecular machinery. And uh, uh, from that uh, to today, so there are about more than, I think it's more than 8,000 uh, structures in the, in the database PDB. Uh, however, uh, our scientists, after we know something, how uh, less machineries work, we always want to try to you know, uh, motivate or build a, a similar machinery for, for work. Uh, so since the first structure was determined, Actually, scientists uh, uh, mention the concept the structure based design. But uh, unfortunately, I think most of our work, uh, structure biologists, uh, what we are doing still to determine structure, uh, there are very few designs. Uh, that's because of uh, the design is very difficult. So, but uh, the situation I think changed uh, several years ago since the uh, they come out of the AlphaFold, now it's AlphaFold 2. So the machine learning based the breakthrough in uh, biology. Uh, actually, AlphaFold can pr predict the structure with you know, amazing accuracy. Uh, it's not only for prediction, but now it can also be used for design, uh, completely new structure uh, that has never you know, shown up in, in nature. So just imagine, so if we can either I think in the near future, if we can design an enzyme, such an enzyme that can highly, you know, efficiently to degrade in plastics. Uh, and I imagine you can design an antigen of HIV CD4 binding site. And that can specifically induce the uh, uh, VRC zero bound like broad neutralization antibody uh, that can, you know, successfully develop the, the vaccine for HIV. And also, for example, for this SARS-CoV-2, the current pandemic and the virus caused the current pandemic. If we know the structure of the S protein, actually we determine the S protein structure for the SARS coronavirus. Uh, with, a, with a structure, you can, if you can quickly, for example, in just one week, you can design a highly you know, specific neutralization antibody through computer, basically. All those uh, works, if we can do in the near future, I think it will, can uh, bring even larger change, not only in structural biology, but in all the field in biology. So basically, uh, can AlphaFold bring another scientific revolution? Uh, I believe so. I think my prediction is that a traditional uh, structural biology will end, uh, go to a dead end in probably uh, five years. And uh, but I think the machine learning based technology will bring a new, uh, complete new structure biology, or should we call it uh, biological structure? Basically, we can based on those uh, the features of microbiomics can design whatever we want, and uh, you know such as enzyme and antibody, but such as like that. Uh, so uh, I think that's. Uh, uh, my personal, I think this is very important in the future. Uh, that's why I raised this topic of a discussion. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you for your presentation and for keeping to the time. Who wants to ask you a question? May I ask what question? I would, yes, hello. Sure. Yes. I would just uh, a small question. So I have not really understood what you plan to do now in the future. You explained wonderfully the story, which we followed well. But what are you yeah, going to do? Uh, basically, uh, my, <laughs> my field is actually structural virology. We are studying viruses, just like what Xiang Xi is, uh, is doing. Uh, and uh, we are trying to, you know, based on the structure law to design a completely new antigen because for vaccine, the antigen is a key for a successful vaccine, uh, such as a HIV vaccine. So, so uh, what we are doing now is actually, for example, for, for dengue virus. Could you remove the, uh, please, your operator, could you remove the slides so that we see all the participants again? 
Oh, okay. The, my lab is doing the structure-based uh, vaccine de development. Basically, we are using the machine learning-based uh, uh, algorithm to design new antigen for vaccine development. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. I thank you for your presentation and go on to the last talk, which is by Yin Wang Zhou. Structural biology in SARS-CoV-2, structures, mechanism, and drug design. Please, Dr. Wang Chou. Uh, it's my great honor to be invited to uh, join the forum uh, here. Uh, my name is uh, Wang Chou Ying, and uh, uh, I'm from Shanghai Institute of Material uh, Medica. Uh, uh, since the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, we set out to find uh, uh, potential antiviral drugs. Uh, firstly, we focus on the SARS-CoV-2 RNA polymerase uh, RDRP, uh, which was known to replicate the viral gene and uh, play a, a vital role in the uh, viral life cycle. Uh, in biochemistry assays, uh, we uh, tested the ability of the triphosphate form of remdesivir to inhibit uh, the activity of the SARS-CoV-2 RDRP to uh, uh, elongate the prime RNA in the presence of 10 millimolar ATP, which is close to the physiologic concentration within soft the first structure of the SARS-CoV-2 RDRP bound to Remdesivir. Uh, the structure reveals that uh, remdesivir uh, in its uh, uh, monophosphate form uh, is covalently linked to the prime RNA uh, at the plus one position uh, and uh, uh, stopped the uh, replication of the uh, uh, viral RNA, the stop the viral genome replication. <coughs> the structures also uh, reveals the mechanism of the RNA recognition by the SARS-CoV-2 RDRP. Uh, following the above work, uh, we developed the uh, VV116, uh, which is a, a nuclear uh, nucleoside prodrug of remdesivir uh, deuterated analog. Uh, but it's orally uh, available with uh, uh, great bioavailability and uh, uh, tissue distribution uh, from remdesivir. In a hand-to-hand -hand, uh, comparison of the antiviral activity uh, of the VV116 uh, with the monopyrary, uh, reveal that VV116 has about uh, five Fold more potential and efficacy uh, than monopyrary in a mass model of viral infection. Uh, besides the oral nucleoside drugs, uh, we also uh, set out to find a non nucleoside inhibitor targeting the SARS CoV 2 uh, RDRP uh, based on the fluorescence elongation assays. We found that. Slamming, a 100 years old drug, uh, is a strong uh, inhibitor of the SARS CoV 2 uh, uh, RDRP uh, with, with 24 fold more uh, potency than the uh, remdesivir uh, TP. Then we solved the uh, first structure of the SARS CoV 2 RDRP uh, bound to slamming. Uh, from the structure, we can see there are extensive poly interactions uh, between the slummy molecules and uh, uh, the uh, subtenes of the ion binding pocket. Comparison with the remdesivir bound uh, RDRP structure, uh, our structure reveals that the slumming uh, directly uh, blocks the binding of both uh, template and uh, uh, prime RNA. Uh, uh, which is different from uh, uh, remdesivir by chain uh, termination. In addition to the studies about RDRP, uh, we also carry out studies on spike protein, mainly on 
uh, Omicron variants. Uh, as we all know, uh, the Omicron variants with over 16 mutations feature fast spreading with serious antibody evasion. Uh, from the structure of the spike trimer uh, with the SE2, uh, we solved. Uh, uh, we can see uh, most uh, mutations of the uh, Omicron spike protein are distributed on the spike surface and uh, change the antigen epitopes uh, and cause immune uh, escape. In addition, uh, we saw a, a structure uh, of the uh, spike protein uh, with a, a broad uh, uh, with a broad spectrum therapeutic antibody, uh, GMB two o o two, the binding epitope of this uh, broad spectrum antibody is different from all previous anti SARS CoV two antibody. Uh, thus, opening a new venue uh, for antibody drug drug discovery, targeting uh, various. Uh, 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 SARS CoV 2, uh, including uh, Omicron. Uh, then uh, we find that uh, BA1 and uh, uh, BA2 uh, spike trimers are able to bind, bind to the uh, mouse uh, SE2 with high potency uh, through the analysis of the basis for their high affinity interactions uh, and the mouse adapted. Uh, uh, mutations in the uh, spike protein. Uh, our result uh, suggests that there are uh, possible regions of the uh, Omicron BA1 and the BA2 variants. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank all the members who participated in our project. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, I thank you for this presentation. Uh, questions to, uh, to this last talk. Maybe Ada Yonat might want to interfere. Ada, did you? I have been, I have been trying to, to insert questions for the last three speakers, and you didn't let me. That's very bad of me. We have, uh, we have yeah. time for one question. Okay. So, so I, will, I will ask now. You, you talked about vaccination. How, how much can you predict uh, mutations in whatever you want to vaccinate against? Hello. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, I can't. Uh, I can't uh, catch up with you. Uh, so, would you please uh, say it uh, again? We seem to be at the uh, blockage here. Ada, do you want to continue? I wanted. This is my question. How much for vaccination? How much a uh, prediction you can in, enforce or you can have in? in predicting new mutations. Sorry, you mean uh, how many virus? Maybe okay. I'll ask again. There will be mutations. Can you predict them? And can you predict which vaccination will be needed? Or whether the, the, there is a general vaccination for mutations that may be coming? Well, it would appear to me that we do not get the desired answer at this moment. We should, I suggest that uh, the question can be answered later when Dr. Yen has had time okay. to think about it. I have one quick question. In your trimers, did you use the 2P variant of the spike protein? Mm -hmm. 
mm, sorry, I can't, I can't catch up with you. <laughs> yeah, all right. So I think we should close this first session. I'm afraid I have to continue chairing the session because our moderator has disappeared. And oh, I want to thank all it's six just, speakers just, for their it, presentations. It, um, excuse me, can you hear me now? I'm back. Yes. Professor oh, Uri. You are back. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm back. very happy. I'm very okay. happy if you are back. Please take yeah. over for the second part of the meeting. Okay. So can you hear my slides? We can see them and hear your voice. Yes. Okay. So I have uh, actually just one last slide to, to show. Uh, previously, I mentioned firstly, we were designed and uh, built up our own focus library. And from there, we were successfully to identify one of the molecules uh, called the MST12 inhibitor that was, can be used for tissue repair and regeneration, spe specifically targeting a kinase called MST12. Another example is we call the kinase SPAK, and that was related to control the chlorine uh, homeostasis. So using this two compound, we were to prove that uh, targeting SPAK can be used for uh, stroke. So this is an example to show that uh, using this small molecule tool, we can do the target validation. And more importantly, as I mentioned before, currently most of the kinase inhibitor has been focused on the, in the use for cancer. So this example also show, demonstrate that untargeted kinase pose promise for the new drug discovery beyond cancer. So that was the, I think, tip, it, it's a, just a brief summary what we have done for targeting untargeted kinase in the past few years. So, and that's all I want to share the scientific. And lastly, it's an acknowledgement for my collaborator and funding agencies. That's all. Yeah, that's my uh, scientific uh, presentation part. Thank you. Okay, then I take it up to me to thank you for your presentation and to invite questions to your presentation. Who wants to interfere? Yes, I would like you? To... Yes. <clears throat> uh, what you, MST, for instance, um, has a big role in inflammation and uh, in both ways. And now you tell us that you want to go beyond cancer, but we now know that inflammation is an important component of defense against cancer. How do you... <clears throat> How do you arrange those things? Okay, you, you, you mean the MST signaling pathway has been involved in the information, right? Yes. Yeah, so here I think as I mentioned, the signaling pathway for HIPPO pathway, actually it is deeply involved in the immunology part. But here we show that in like an accurate liver uh, failure in that kind of situation, and the high dose of APAP. And then with, because the small molecule you can use when you need it. So it's not a long-term treatment. So my, in that case, it's kind of can uh, jump the-, the uh, Okay, that's fine. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, well, it, given the advanced time, I want to thank again all speakers in the first session and to hand over the meeting to Professor Cheng to lead the second part of the program. Okay, uh, thank you so much for Professor Udrich. And then that's, I think, uh, time will fast late. Let's go into the second part. We have, uh, I think, we all have a question ready for all your, our Nobel laureates and who want to be the first? For question. Well, uh, can can I have a question? Yeah, to to Professor Teng. Um, uh, okay. yeah, thank you. you. Yeah. Excuse you... me, Erwin. I have to intervene. Yeah. The question should be asked by the 
young scientists to oh, ask. I see. I'm we sorry. are not supposed sorry. to ask questions here. Yeah. Okay, so in this section, our, we will ask questions first and then to get the answer for, from four of you. And then we might can have more discussion uh, between us. Yeah. Is anybody want to be the first? So my, my ask first. Sure, please. So my ask uh, Professor Wusserich uh, one question. Basically, you mentioned uh, a lot of time with AlphaFold. So what's your comments on offer the machine learning based uh, uh, you know, structure for teaching in the future? And what's the impact on structural biology and all the whole biology field? Well, I'm currently collecting input from all sides about the value of these structure predictions. And as you have heard earlier in the discussion today, the uh, medicinal chemists tend to base their work rather on, uh, on experimental data. I'm convinced that these structure predictions will tremendously facilitate the experimental structure determination. I'm sure that within a short time, the experimental structure determinations of most proteins, not all, I mean, if a fold lies outside of the present uh, fold, uh, uh, the no, present no, no, no. wealth of known faults, it will not work, of course. Mm -hmm. But I'm also sure that there is no competition from alpha fault with NMR because they are not capable for the time being of making any statements about flexibly disordered polypeptide mm -hmm. mm -hmm. chains. Yes. Uh, I think these are the two things that I want to say. That depends on the training data. I think with the lab training data, the, the well, if you, uh, I wish well. you luck in training the program for predicting the structure of unstructured polypeptide chains. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions? So actually, they may take the advantage. I, I also have the similar question regarding like alpha for this kind of uh, AI, we, we all know it has been applied in the multi-scale and different disciplines. So what, what do you think about the AI can really do in the drug discovery? This might be a question for the, also for Professor Udrich. What do you think about that? Well, I would actually like to share uh, responding to this question with Ada Yonat, if she agrees. Very well. Really agree. I, I have to say something. I can say something. So AlphaFold is based on, the, the, the power of AlphaFold is based on known structures. And now there are 80,000 of them, so there is a, a, a lot of known information. But uh, there is very little about uh, um, mo motions, movements, very little about small proteins, and nothing, almost nothing about RNA and protein interactions, or RNA alone. It means for ribosomes, it is still too early. Proteins are too small, Protein RNA is hardly known. RNA RNA is hardly known too. So AlphaFold can be still progressing to become AlphaFold 3 and have also this type of, uh, of input. And I have, in, in this regard, I have also a question to all speakers. You all talked about inhibiting proteins or protein uh, expression or protein uh, action after proteins have been made. Did you, did you consider to inhibit the making of these proteins? Mm -hmm. It means getting on the messenger RNA that codes for them and, and they stop it selectively, of course, for the proteins 
that we want to, to get rid of. I think that this, this will be, uh, if, one do, if one does it, this may save a lot of effort and be very successful. Yeah, I think it, uh, thanks Professor Yunesh. It's a, a very good question. Also, I think currently also has some, uh, oh no, it's very few reports regarding, like you mentioned, targeting the process, like making the protein. So that RNA and those kind of things, but it's different. It's an, in my mind, it's an emerging field also has couple reports coming for, for for doing that, so, so, and I also, yeah, also you you have previously also mentioned regarding those kind of evaluating a drug or a compound for the side effects. In 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 that case, I would say typically we would see in a comprehensive view, like uh, to see the therapeutic window, like put into the in vivo system. So not just, uh, so definitely we have a potential target for exactly we want to target, but in the end, we will need to see they have safety therapeutic window in first in animal, and then we might be further move forward. Yeah. Of course you're right, but to find targets, to find diseases, even Alzheimer's disease, just to prevent making the proteins that cause Alzheimer. And the success of the vaccination to COVID is a, a, a good example to show that this, this uh, attitude should be well, should be, should be successful, should lead to the results that we are interested in, which is getting rid of a disease, whatever you, have, you want to call it. The COVID-19 vaccine is not completely successful yet. All right. I, Nothing is complete. I want, Nothing. To, <laughs> I want to intervene again also. I'm no longer the chair, but we have a clear instructions that each of the young scientists is entitled to ask one question to one or, or all of the laureates. And I would like to suggest that we keep to this uh, to this uh, protocol because I assume that all of you have prepared one question to yeah. start the second part. Yes, thank you, Professor Urich, to mention. So maybe we can get started from the Jian Jinchen. Any questions? Sure, sure. Thank you. I will go first then. Uh, maybe, well, maybe uh, first of this second part. Uh, so. Uh, as a medicinal chemist, uh, one question also uh, I always want to ask is our, uh, you know, uh, uh, new model is we have a molecular target and we want to hit the target with the most uh, potent compound, but it's very hard for us to design some molecules that have uh, weak activity against a whole panel of different targets. Uh, that's uh, maybe a polypharmacology, maybe something related to the traditional Chinese medicine that we don't know which target uh, this uh, soup will hit, but it may interfere with a lot of different targets. I wonder uh, whether the uh, uh, Loris can uh, share uh, some their opinions on how to study this polypharmacology or uh, uh, traditional Chinese uh, medicine. Thank you. Thank you. That's my question. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I think uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, harbors a huge reservoir of compounds which um, uh, 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 target signaling mechanisms. I mean, we have learned over the last 50 years a wealth of um, uh, knowledge about signaling mechanisms. And it is clear to me at least that traditional Chinese medicine or the, the, the uh, ingredients of them target 
these signaling mechanisms because uh, targeting a signaling mechanism is much more efficient uh, than say targeting a protein which is abundant uh, uh, in mass in the, in the tissue, you know. But of course, um, uh, the other aspect of traditional Chinese medicine is uh, the right combination, the balanced um, uh, uh, use of different compounds, of many compounds to find uh, compositions which somehow average out the adverse effect and bring up the wanted effect. And I think this links to uh, one of the presentations uh, uh, this morning, uh, which showed that uh, the um, uh, computational approach and all the approaches we heard uh, this morning about are very good at making a drug uh, more specific for a certain uh, isoform uh, of, um, uh, of a protein, you know? But even if you have a drug which is very specific to just say one splice uh, uh, form or, or one subtype of a receptor, there is still the problem that this um, uh, uh, re receptor probably occurs in many different tissues. Say it occurs in the heart, it occurs in, in the brain. That's for instance the case for, uh, for several calcium channels. Uh, and so even if you have a very specific drug with respect to the molecule involved, you still have to somehow um, uh, uh, solve the problem that it acts only in the context uh, uh, that you want. And I think this is uh, also part of traditional Chinese medicine that just by experience, by trial and error over thousands of years, uh, combinations of uh, uh, substances have been found, which do this averaging in the sense of bringing out desired effects and uh, mutual compensation of toxic or undesired effects. Thank That's you. Thank you. My, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe a follow up uh, a question or comment. So uh, you, you, you may know that the uh, cannabidiol or CBD from marijuana. It seems mm -hmm. nobody has uh, fully demonstrated the uh, mechanisms of action for this compound CBD, but it is, mm -hmm. uh, it shows very, you know, uh, solid effects in the treatment of uh, epilepsy. So can you also comment a little bit on this? Well, I'm not a specialist in cannabis uh, receptors, but of course there are many laboratories worldwide working on uh, uh, the different aspects of, of the way it, it, it acts, you know. Um, and uh, of course there are the receptors known, you know, that there is uh, uh, much knowledge of where the receptors are expressed in the brain, but I think it's just ongoing work uh, and we have to be a little bit patient to uh, uh, learn the whole story. Thank you. Any question from Professor Wang for our Laurace? All right. Uh, um, maybe I want to ask that uh, Professor Osrich, and uh, as you just mentioned that uh, alpha fold can uh, om do almost uh, what we are known to, to solve structure. And uh, what we doing is try to use this structure information to design some molecular. For that design opinion, uh, uh, there are two opinions. One of is one disease, one, uh, one target, one disease. This is what we are doing. Uh, we are trying to uh, get more selective or more uh, high affinity compound for that specific target. But the second question is, uh, the second opinion is similar with uh, Jen Jun's uh, mentioned, that is polypharmacology. It's in CNS drug, it's, uh, everybody says that uh, if you target more than one target, it may be can achieve a more efficient uh, therapeutic effect that is uh, explained as shotgun, not a ma magic bullet. Uh, what I'm wondering is that 
how can we identify that real uh, target for that diseases? Just imagine that uh, drug discovery, all of our knowing target is coming from the first, we know that drug, at least for that, uh, uh, for that uh, mental illness. First, we know that drug can uh, have some treatment for that specific diseases. Then we use that drug to find the target. And then we use that target to uh, modify that drug or keep continue to put this uh, drug to move on. But for the polypharmacology, that is a little bit get rid of this trail. I don't know, how do you comment for this theory? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, let me give you a limited response, which uh, is from a field that we both know rather well. In GPCRs, we, uh, the search for drugs has so far mostly been for ligands that bind to the orthosteric site. However, it becomes more and more clear that PAMs and NAMs, I mean, positive and negative uh, allosteric modulators will be a new field that has hardly been, I think it has hardly or not at all been uh, successfully exploited that will help us to improve the function, the efficacy of, uh, of drugs that bind to the orthosteric site, and it may also help to reduce unwanted side effects. So there you have an interplay of at least two and possibly multiple binding sites for different chemical compounds, each of which could be part of a, a, a drug cocktail that might be successfully used. Yeah, that is for just for that one target. Uh, you can find a ton of the different sites you can target. What I mentioned is that in the science uh, drug discovery, they have another opinion that if, if one drug can target multiple targets, the different protein, you will have the, some benefit uh, therapeutic effect. So what, what's your opinion for that specific theory? Well, I mean, uh, there is an intense search of the databases of the libraries of drugs and of previously, uh, previously investigated drug candidates in the hope that they might be found to be effective against the new disease. I mean, typically you would have a drug that has been patented for a particular disease, and then you are incredibly lucky and find out this now helps with a new, um, a new pathology, and you can save a lot of uh, you can save a lot of effort and shorten the time by which you can get this new uh, applic this same drug for the new application on the market. I don't know whether I answered your question properly, but it seems to me that this is part of the game with uh, drug molecules that target more than one receptor site. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, I think uh, that question I have, I might have my uh, few my thoughts regarding the polypharmacology. I think in that case, I think previously Professor Naha also mentioned signaling pathway targeting specific signaling is either could be a specific target or a specific pathway. In that case, that was the I think in the last two decades we have many successful cases. Regarding the polypharmacology, we definitely need a new, maybe we need to go back to the phenotype screening and then they will give you a more robust uh, readout and then to find out the good compounds. Otherwise, I mean, it, it just uh, simply to say uh, how to do the polypharmacology just uh, one by one, 
in my opinion, it seems it, it's really difficult to, to say because in that case, polypharmacology not just mean you need to hit both target very strongly, might be some kind of synergy maybe come from. So in that case, we, in my opinion, we might need a certain kind of uh, more comprehensive readout and might be an, an whole organism or at least in the cell base, not the biochemical assay. Yeah, that's my opinion. So here I have a specific question for Professor Hoffman regarding the immuno-oncology therapies. So I think uh, as an expert and uh, you, you are an expert in immunology and we all know in the past decade, the like a PD-1, this kind of oncoimmunotherapy has boosted and also gained a great success in, in, in clinical. So, but, and what do you mean, uh, uh, what do you think about is that really this kind of, we also know lots of big farm has been put tons of efforts in the oncoimmunotherapy. Uh, what's your opinion regarding the oncoimmunotherapy for cancer treatment? They were safe or, or it, it's kind of, and what's the future trend for oncoimmunotherapy? Thank you, Professor well, Hoffman. Yeah. Thank don't thank me before I've answered. Uh, so uh, my feeling is, um, you know, it's I'm working on innate immunity. You may be aware of that. And there is no, there are no lymphocytes. And 95% of all animals on earth have no lymphocytes. Only 5% of the animals have lymphocytes. But of course, I'm following with great interest what is going on in uh, the adaptive immune system. So I think that um, uh, we are probably, uh, we have been over the last 20, 30 years, too focused, the community has been too focused on the, uh, on, uh, let me say, cancer-centric research. And we have now, um, well, we have understood, the community has understood over the last 15 years, that there's also a very large part of immune influence and this is mediated largely by the microenvironment of the tumor. You see, we have a variety of cells, cell types, which produce a variety of um, various uh, uh, substances, uh, namely cytokines, namely, uh, and so on. And um, so uh, at this moment, at this stage, I think uh, we still have to, this a lot of work going on. If you follow the literature, what you certainly do, there are many, many papers appearing uh, every month, I should say, or nearly every week on uh, those controls between the, the dialogue between the cancer cells and the uh, lymphocytes within the uh, soup of the microenvironment, which contains many other cells. So I think it's a very important field and uh, something will come out of it for sure. Okay, yes, thank you so much for Professor Hoffman. You're yeah, welcome. Yeah. So let's move forward. Uh, Professor Xiang, any question? Or you already, I know you already asked one question for Professor Udrich. Any more questions? I can ask a more question uh, for Professor Hoffman. So basically, uh, you just might ask the PD-1 uh, related question. Uh, another question I want to ask is, uh, what's your comments on, on the molecule steam in the uh, innate immune uh, system? Yeah, well, that's a very interesting question. You know that we, we now have learned that sting appears very early in evolution mm -hmm. and it's maintained in all the forms. So it's really a molecule which is essential, mm -hmm. uh, not only for development and for immune responses and so on. So my feeling about, is that your question, what is my feeling about it? You mean, if it can be used uh, one day, uh, well, it, has, it is present also in, in um, uh, animals, in flies on which we work mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on. And, uh, so we're trying to see uh, how uh, the system has evolved for instance, you know, we're working on Drosophila and there are about 25 species of Drosophila and all the genomes are known by now. And yeah, so even that, bacteria. 
I mean, even even in bacteria, you can find it. Some bacteria, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So, um, can you be precise in your question? Well, my feeling is, my feeling is, it's a very important field. Okay. Field, and we are in our laboratory, which is uh, under the uh, supervision of Jean-Luc Imler. We are working very hard on this system in collaboration with other laboratories, and there's a lot of. Uh, just to give you one example. The connection between uh, sea gas this, uh, uh -huh. and thing uh, was only reported about, uh, well, it was in 1913, so that's about 20 years ago. Before that, uh -huh. uh, oh, for 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Before that, uh, we were not aware, the community was not aware. Um, sting was discovered in uh, the late 19, I'm sorry. 2008 by uh, Barber in Miami, mm -hmm. and then came the discovery by uh, uh, our Chinese friend in uh, Dallas uh, yes. about uh, the connection. Yes, Hong Bing, so Hong Bing. Yes, mm -hmm. James Chen. James Chen, we say. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay, you. So that, uh, that's uh, I'm uh, I'm happy to see that. Uh, uh, well, all the presentations. This is general comment. All the presentations were excellent, which I heard this morning, and I see that you're. So, really what's your good. prediction on the the possible discovery of steam to win the Nobel Prize? <laughs> well, <laughs> steam gas pathway, yes, that would be. Uh, you know, Nobel prizes are never predictable. <laughs> okay, I <laughs> see. <it>. Thank you. <laughs> you can ask all of us, and we will say that's well. Uh, you have to be lucky. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you're welcome. So we have, uh, I, I mean, we might can have uh, one more question from Professor Yin. Any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a, a small question. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic is uh, uh, going on uh, and maybe uh, uh, the uh, next uh, uh, possible virus uh, epidemic uh, will will come. Uh, I'm uh, I was wondering, uh, in order to better deal with the possible uh, virus uh, epidemic next time, uh, what should we do now? Especially uh, uh, in basic research. Uh, thank you. I think this question can be for any our Nora is here, right? Yeah, C could you share some of your comments? Uh, my comment is uh, uh, in order to better deal with the uh, possible uh, virus epidemic uh, next time, uh, what should we do now uh, uh, about the basic research of the uh, virus? Uh, uh, or something. Okay. I mean, uh, any comments from our Nobel laureates regarding Professor Ying's question? How can we prepare for the next uh, any kind of virus or what kind of this kind of pandemic? What we can do with that? Maybe. Okay. Maybe before we prepare for the next one, I want to understand why do you think that COVID-19 is out? It can still have 258 different mutations. Then you call it Omicron, you call it any name you want. Excuse me, Abdal. Virus, but it can still, yeah. Abdal. I think it can have many more mutations. It can be billions and billions of mutations no, no, that we have not yet seen. It was calculated. The, the number was calculated by the number of, of uh, amino acids in the spike protein. And it's only 300 and something. That's not I enough cannot... for you. Well, you, you, I mean, maybe, in principle, maybe we can recalculate, but this is the minimum number. Yes. Um, um, may uh, I say that? At any rate, the, the idea that there are still mutations 
that uh, we didn't catch it does, does not say that the pandemic is over. Just say that it may be, but it also may stay. And yeah. Yes, please, uh, Professor Holtman. Yeah, any comments? Uh, yeah, well, I would, um, it's an independent comment. I, I don't, I want it to be very neutral. Uh, I know that we have on both sides, side, sides of the Himalayas, we have selected different techniques to fight this virus, uh, this pandemic. So my question, I was interested to see that among the presentations, which you obviously had selected here in the organization, there were persons who were targeting the development of the virus and persons who were targeting the fight against the virus by the immune system, let's say by the lymphocytes and so antibodies, B cells, and so on. So uh, do you think that that is, um, it seems to me a good strategy in as far as you have killing the virus directly or blocking its transmission, it's um, and so on, is one thing. Blocking, uh, producing antibodies is another thing. Do you think that the two together will help to eliminate finally this pandemic? I, yeah, I think regarding, yeah, I, I, I would agree. It, in, in that case, might be in both ways, right? It, yes. One way to, to protect our host, another way to cure the virus directly. I think that would be perfectly. And then, <laughs> yeah, to, to might be shut down the, 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 the virus. Yeah, I think yeah. it's, like uh, I would like to say uh, today, I think uh, first I would like to just uh, might be due to the time, I would, might uh, give uh, some uh, brief summary. Today we have, I think we invited four Nobel laureates here. So we were to be very glad to see actually two Nobel laureates is in the physiology or medicine and then two in the chemistry. So in our side, our six of us, I think we have uh, two medicinal chemistry, I think based. Uh, and another four speaker was from the structure base of point for the drug discovery, either for immunology, I think. And for, regarding the drug discovery here, we have working on the small molecule, also working on the vaccine and big molecule and antibody, this kind of things. So yeah, we, we also gained a uh, lot of uh, insights from all four of you to give us to, yeah, I think we, it's definitely, I think this kind of forum could inspire us to think more and more deeply for the uh, scientific question. So yeah, I, I would say uh, with, I, at this for me, I learned a lot from this, the, uh, for thank you so much thank you for inviting us well it thank was you. a pleasure yeah. thank, thank you. you thank you professor you can yeah thank good, you goodbye uh, everything bye bye i, I look like forward to seeing you here uh, uh, professor woodridge <laughs> good professor you, you, you can be in contact Talk we have about been... the delay with the paper thank you thank you bye see bye. you thank you thank you bye 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 bye, -bye. Bye.